Dr. Jung, I'm super excited to have you on the show. And the way I discovered you was actually, I've been searching for content around Asian American theology. And I've, as I've been Googling, I found this outstanding lecture that you gave at Princeton University, about 50 years of Asian American studies and Asian American theology. And so I watched your full lecture and I thought you did a fantastic job, like not only presenting the information, but also engaging the students. And I want to ask you, like, how did that event even happen? So um, we thought it was at Princeton. Huh? <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah, that's right. I'm yeah. trying to reply. Um, <laughs> Princeton was starting and is an American Institute. And so they had invited me to um, a conference that they were hosting. And um, I think in 2019, and they re-invited me back last year. And as they were beginning their institute, they wanted to learn what they could um, develop from Asian American studies overall and how it's applicable to the development of an Asian American theology institute. And so that's how that talk came about, because I'm more of an Asian American studies scholar than I am a theology. I'm not I'm not even a theologian. So but I study sociology of religion. And so I know a little bit about what few Asian American theology books and texts there are. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your your journey? You're studying at Stanford in Berkeley and moving into sociology and then specifically focusing in on Asian American studies. Well, I grew up in San Francisco. I'm a fifth generation um, Chinese American. And growing up in San Francisco, um, I had two sort of major influences. One, I grew up in a Chinese American church that was right across the street. It was fundamentalist, um, very Bible believing, and um, but Chinese American. So everything was in English. And I grew up in that really tight, small subculture of the church family. At the same time, um, even in high school, I had ethnic studies. I had an Asian American studies class. I was involved with um, community activism. Even during high school, we did a public service radio show. And so um, in that context, I grew up in a very progressive, politically active environment. Um, back then, um, the International Hotel in, on the border of Manila Town and Chinatown was a major housing struggle for um, elderly Manong and Chinese. And um, affirmative action was being contested at the moment. And so I knew a lot about the issues facing um, Asian Americans um, while growing up. I had also, um, you know, I, I, we went to Chinatown regularly. My dad worked in Chinatown and I saw the conditions in San Francisco Chinatown. And I knew that working class people um, had so many more struggles than middle class people. So I had these two influences. I had this progressive political stream and then a very conservative uh, Chinese church stream. And then I went to college and I tried to sort of um, wrestle and figure out, well, what do I value? What do I believe? And it took a long journey of being able to integrate both my faith with my racial activism. And eventually I, it's been a lifelong journey and I've realized that um, that sort of, those twin influences have continued to shape me and I've continued to continually integrate them and um, so my I've discerned my calling to be working with people of color and empowering the communities in line with God's um, kingdom values of justice and peace and then I tried to figure out okay in terms of career how can I actually do that how can I work with communities of color and low-income people and so I tried different things I worked in politics I worked in education I worked in media and eventually I went to grad school and even my scholarship then tried to integrate how do I find the intersection, how do I address the intersection of um, Asian American communities, especially um, those at risk, and the intersection of faith and religion and religious institutions. And so my PhD dissertation was on um, Asian American churches. Through that um, dissertation, then I entered the field of Asian American studies. I was getting my degree in sociology. And um, because I studied an Asian American topic, I was able to enter Asian American studies. The, the field of Asian American studies, did it start uh, start to begin around the 1970s? Yeah, the field of Asian American studies started with ethnic studies. Um, it came out of San Francisco State, where I teach now, about 51 years ago, 52 years ago. 
had the longest college student strike at, um, ever, six months struggle, and they founded the College of Ethnic Studies at San Francisco State. So it became an academic field um, around that time. And so I took Asian American Studies maybe 20 years after its founding, um, began to go to grad school 30 years after its founding. So there was really little research on um, Asian Americans and religion. And ethnic studies background um, tend to be Marxian in approach. And so they sort of saw religion as the opiate of the masses. And so they sort of early on didn't really study um, the role of religion in the community's life. But, you know, like every community, religion has a major impact. And so um, it's significant both in the political, you know, mobilization of the community and, you know, the mental health of the community and so, so many aspects of it. When did a focus in on like religion and or spirituality come into play when it came to Asian American studies and, and the relationship between Asian Americans and the role of religion? Yeah. So again, those are, we have different institutions. So um, Asian American studies as an academic field started in the late sixties. Um, at the same time, because of the civil rights movement and the student movements, um, denominational caucuses, Asian American church people were also organizing, trying to come up with their own sense of identity, their own sense of theology. So they began, at least especially in mainline denominations, creating caucuses, um, groups of ethnic churches coming together to resist white assimil assimilation and to you know, rediscover their Asian Americanness. By the 19 mid 70s, early 80s, and seminaries began to develop Asian American theological institutes. And that's when you began to see more literature um, published and more research on Asian American theology. So while you have Asian American studies in secular schools, in religious studies and in theology, maybe 10, 15 years afterwards came Asian American study of religion and theology. So now, it, so again, it was mostly mainline um, evangelicals because they have the sense, of, oh, we just have a universal transcendent approach to the scriptures. Race really doesn't matter. They didn't really start addressing mm. um, the role of race either in interpreting scriptures or shaping our church life until uh, much, much later. And that's why, you know, Princeton is just beginning its institute and trying to incorporate a lot of evangelical um, research into their work. That's fascinating. As you've been following this, what have been some of the, maybe some of the themes that have been very important in Asian American studies that have related to some of the themes that are covered in Asian American theology? Yeah, that's a great question. I think if you look at Asian American theology, a lot of the early um, writings dealt with uh, liminality and marginality. So it was a, first a recognition, while as a racial group, we really do face um, oppression similar to other communities of color. And we have to uh, um, understand white supremacy and um, systems of racial oppression and how that shaped our theology and our understanding. Um, later on, Asian American theology, I really respect theologians because they really do use current literature. And so they began to um, incorporate a lot of the current sociological approaches, um, critical race approaches. And so now they, they use a lot of um, different types of analyses. So beyond understanding how Asian Americans are an oppressed racial, racialized group, um, they began then quickly to use an intersectional approach. So Asian American feminist theologians um, centered women and looked at how um, religion um, impacts them and how they impact their, you know, church life. So there's a lot of feminist writings. Um, there's a, um, and then the other big change in Asian American studies is because in the beginning, we studied a lot about the role of race and how we belong to the United States because we're trying to claim the United States. Then we had a transnational turn to say, oh, we're not just Americans, but we're also Asians and to look at that transnational impact. And so you have a <clears throat> transnational, intersectional racial approach in both Asian American studies and Asian American theology now, I think. Yeah, and I'm glad you mentioned the Asian feminist theology movement. I think that's also super important and also a really good lens um, 
I don't know too much about it, but one thing that I discovered was that there was this issue with kind of this, um, obviously with Christianity and colonialism and like this like lordship and servant relationship. And a lot of people, a lot of women feeling like Jesus is Lord and I'm a servant. And there's like issues with like Lord servant uh, dichotomy. And so I think, I think the, the Asian American perspective on theology is super important, especially dealing with issues of oppression. And it reminds me a lot of black liberation theology. Yeah, it's really similar. It's a lot, um, a lot of Asian American theology can fall under liberation theologies, you know, and from Asia, there's a lot of liberation theologies too coming from Asia, you know, Minjung theology. Um, and the other thing that's, um, that we do in Asian American studies and in Asian American th- um, theology is we really take a hybridic approach, right? That um, what we're trying to do is connect um, different cultural perspectives, racialized perspectives, indigenous perspectives to American perspectives. So we use English, but we try to incorporate um, different concepts like Han from Korea or um, I developed an approach called Li Yi, which is a Confucian perspective in understanding religion. And so I think that trying to um, use indigenous understandings rather than Western understandings are really um, helpful in both um, making Asian American theology resonate with Asian American lives and also as being sort of a alternative to Western colonized perspectives. Yeah, I think that's the really hard thing because when we, we see the trauma that Christianity has caused with colonization and kind of coming in and this is going to be the religion you follow. That is very, very oppressive. And so I'm kind of curious, like in ethnic studies, like how is Christianity looked at? Because I can't imagine it being favorable. Like I think it's both and we recognize it as being part of the colonizing process, but it has liberating um, themes. You know, the African-American church, you know, historically has used biblical themes and in the same way, I think the Asian American church um, can reappropriate biblical themes to make it both resonant today and to be um, a gift to the broader church. So, um, you know, Fuller Amos Young said, African Americans have a theology of liberation. Latinos have a theology of um, the border, right? And I know Robert Chow Romero talked about the Brown Church. Amos Young said Asian Americans have are, are developing a theology of exile. That because we're part of diaspora, because we've often had to come to different places, um, to the U.S. out of war, out of um, poverty, um, we understand what it means to be a resident alien. We understand what it means to be a citizen, not of this earth. And so I really um, resonated with that perspective. And I think I, I tried to develop that thinking a lot in my memoir. So I wrote a spiritual memoir. And the idea of exile became its dominant um, narrative arc. Yeah, that's something that I, I really want to learn more about this, like theology of exile. Like, mm-hmm. as as what are some of the the themes or concerns that are kind of um, within that theology? Well, I could talk about my memoir that the themes that I wrestle with. Yes. A lot. Um, and you know, again, I'm fifth generation Asian American. So you would think I would have a sense of belonging, that I would have a sense of rootedness and home. And in some ways I do. But I think because I'm a racial minority, because I grew up Chinese in the U.S., the issue of identity became really, really dominant. Right. And especially for young people um, trying to unpack your identity and then your sense of community. Um where do you belong, I think is a pretty dominant issue, um, especially in even in America's racial hierarchy, that's really white, black. So Asian Americans, Latinos, they don't fit in that binary. And so that question of identity, especially your group identity and your collective identity and your sense of community is really um, a, a significant concern. And I think the biblical story has a lot of people caught in between um, people who are traveling to new places and have um, different identities, people who are migrants and need to maintain an identity in the face of a colonizing empire. And so issues of identity and belonging and even sense of home 
are pretty prevalent in the Bible. I think it's sort of like the whole notion of heaven and um, being citizens of heaven relates to your sense of being home, secure and safe and a sense of shalom and peace. Um, the other part of diaspora besides identity and belonging is just um, being on a journey as pilgrims and um, going through your life history as um, then how does that apply to your sense of calling um, when you're for a racial minority? What's your calling when you're a marginalized, powerless mm. group of people, right? How do you, how do you, for me, if my sense of calling is affecting change, how do you affect change when you're, you're again, a minority whose um, status is lower, where you don't have power? And you don't seek power the way the world seeks power, right? So it'd be like, do we try to adopt Trump principles? We try to become complicit with partisan you know, parties, or do we try to develop alternative ways? So for me, the sense of calling and how do you relate to this world um, as an exile is a whole different approach than just trying to adopt world's approaches of power, of um, dominance, and, uh, and then oppression. Because what happens is, if you seek power, you, oppressed people just become oppressors themselves. And so we need a whole, we have to be healed mm. before we could actually um, be God's instruments. How has the Asian American identity and the oppression you faced and being marginalized, how has that impacted your own faith? I think the first thing it does is it's given me a longing for something more, for something else. Um, I. I live in a low income neighborhood and I just look around my neighborhood with so many unhoused people. I, there's the homeless encampments are huge and they're trashed and they're desolate. And so if I see that on a regular basis and I, my friends are living there. So now it's raining. And the first thing I think about is how are my friends doing in the rain, right? Developing a sense of solidarity makes me just long for something more. Know that this world is not our home and that, um, we need to be praying thy kingdom come. And so I think for me, the first thing is that it, the marginalized status reminds me that um, we need to be prayerful, we need to be hopeful, and we need um, to be in solidarity to have something more. Um, um, I think it also connects me to scriptures, because then if you read scriptures from the eyes of the poor, you totally see it, how much scriptures speak to you, how much Jesus met um, people on the margins. You see how much the cause for justice are valid today as they were during the times of the prophets. And so there are a lot of ways, I think, that Jesus' preferential option for the poor, Jesus' concern for the marginalized, um, connects um, to our own sense of marginality. And it just makes me um, look to God as a liberator and as someone to um, redeem not just our personal sins, but redeem a lot of the structural sins of the world and also how we treat the environment. I love what you just said there. And I also love like how you addressed, like not only your faith, your spirituality, uh, your time of prayer, obviously thinking about these issues seriously, writing about them and also being an activist. Like you're, you're, you're involved in all aspects. And I, I'm even thinking about at the beginning of the pandemic, just the dramatic increase in xenophobia and anti-Asian racism that's happening all around the world, especially here in the U.S. with the rise of Trump and uh, increased visibility of white supremacy. And um, I was looking at some of the work you've been doing to help stop the hate, stop the racism, and beginning to kind of pull in these stories, um, attacks and hate towards Asian Americans. And I bring that up because like, not only are you like researching, writing, teaching classes on this, your whole life is invested in this movement of, of helping to bring healing. And I wonder if you can kind of just share like how you moved from, you know, moving from a, a prayer and from a research standpoint to then I want to be an activist. I want to actually do more than just research this. Yeah. So I, I see myself and my sense of calling is being a scholar activist. And it's a really a privileged position that I could actually do for my work um, 
researching communities of color. But the research isn't just theoretical, but it's research on how can we have praxis that's useful, applicable, and um, effective. And so part of my research is doing community-engaged research. So right now I helped start this organization called Stop AAPI Hate with two civil rights organizations. And working with them, we document the hate, but we also try to come up with policies that are effective in addressing the racism we're experiencing now during COVID-19. Um, at the same time, so I'm doing this scholarship that I think is applied. And then, so that's sort of two worlds, right? Your scholarly world and your policy world. And then I also want to bring my own faith perspective in too. So I throw that into, and not only do I write about these are what I think are driving um, the racist acts against Asian Americans, but this is how God sees it. And this is how the church is both inciting the racism and resisting the racism, and then what others can do. So I think for me, I like that um, being at the intersection of all those things and not just studying theology, but doing theology, not just doing all this activity, but actually um, reflecting and having some time to think, are we doing these things in the best way possible? Are we doing these things in line with the Holy Spirit? Are we doing these things um, working with the church and with other communities? So yeah, it's, I'm in a real privileged position now to bring both my church life, my academic life, and my political active activism all together. And just for an example, so I'm I'm reading a lot as a sociologist of religion and a sociologist of social movements, how Christian nationalism is probably the best predictor of Trumpism and racism. It's not white evangelicals, but it's actually this notion that America should be a white Christian nation. So it's the marriage of Christianity plus um, white supremacy plus conservative political ideology. So this actually can actually help um, redeem evangelicals for like, i think the ev evangelical church is really on a decline has a really poor witness but if we recognize that evangelicals who are more religious are less racist than let's say white nas um, christian nationalists then we see there's a distinct type of christianity that's driving a lot of the racism and so um understanding that christian nationalism has also driven and created a lot of anti-asian hate Right, they they Christian nationalists agree with the term Chinese virus. Christian nationalists agree that we should ban immigration. If we understand Christian nationalism as a source of the racism against Asian Americans, then we can develop policies, and we could also develop theological approaches and also church movements to resist against Christian nationalism. So, by identifying the source of the racism, we can find more effective solutions to the the problem. And that's what we're doing now. We're documenting the hate and trying to you know, come up with policies that really get at the issue. The other thing driving racism is this whole yellow peril stereotype that Asians are outsiders coming to invade the West. Uh, we should fear them. Um, they're invading us with their diseases. And so U.S.-China relations is really pivotal to this racism. So we're trying to um, address that um, aspect of the source of racism. So you got politics, you have real, um, foreign policy, you have church life. And so um, I'm trying to get at the roots to get to real solutions. Yeah. And as you're sharing that, like some of the saddest forms of racism I see is when it's coming from the church or this like Christian nationalism, like in the name of waving the Bible and the crosses and like we we just saw the the insurrection, the domestic terrorism in our capital, where you saw religion being used to kind of incite this violence, the blowing of the shafar, the, the crosses, the be to save yeah, signs. Yeah. It's just for me, it's just blasphemous and heretical. It really saddens me. Um, I grieve over how the Lord's name is used. I grieve over how Jesus and the cross is born in that way, and so. I think we all need to repent of our complicity with this. And I think um, it's such a bad witness that that's why I think, you know, America, um, the the numbers of people not attending church and the numbers of people disaffiliating and especially millennial and 
the next generations were just leaving the church. So a lot of it's due because of this um, marriage of the Republican Party with white evangelicalism, right? It is Christian nationalism that's driving the decline of the church in America. And unless we Christians um, prophesy and stop it, it's, it's going to continue to um, degrade God's name and lead to a more poor witness. I actually, I actually think it's satanic, right? I think it's like, wow, how people could buy into lies. I think how people could um, pursue and follow those lies. It's sort of like, for me, apocalyptic and end times. So I grew up with that sort of eschatological end times approach, and I see the end times and how people have responded to Christian mm. nationalism. Yeah, I mean, like, whenever I'm chatting with people at work or meeting others, and I kind of share a little bit about my my background that I'm a Christian, I have to almost qualify that now. Because if I say I'm a Christian and I'm white, that has all these implications that I'm part of the Trump movement, that I'm like in favor of this, right? Because all that stuff is kind of combined together. And so even now today, I'm like, I had to qualify myself. I, I tell people I'm a Christian, but I'm not part of that that hate, that um, that nationalism that's going on. Yeah. So any any evangelical group has to really consider, do we want to continue holding this label when it's so politicized, right? Um, and in a lot of senses, I think, yeah, mm -hmm. I don't, it's it's a political term and not a theological perspective. And so we just should just get rid of it. But again, I think the, the concept of Christian nationalism can be used a lot more. It's more appropriate than calling people white evangelicals all the time, because I think that's the constellation of beliefs and ideologies that's driving a lot of it, not necessarily evangelicalism itself. So, um, I mean, I even appreciate the term white evangelicalism because I could be evangelical because I'm not white. It sort of like buffers me a bit, but I think it is a real contested firm. And I, I know um, evangelicals for social action, a group that does a lot of social justice work, they change their name to Christians for social action because mm. and you don't have to explain yourself all the time. <laughs> I want to ask you, like, how do you, manage your mental health during this time amid the anti-Asian racism and then also with your work and documenting and tracking these stories happening all over because there's a lot of trauma which can trigger us and reading these stories over and over again can lead to you know depression and grief and other issues, other traumatic issues. Yeah, you know, I think about, you know, people talk about in the pandemic, we can't wait till it's over. But I think about people, again, my unhoused friends, who the ending of the pandemic, vaccinations won't make any difference to their lives, right? They have a lifetime of, or at least a longer period of not having the hope of going back to normal. So what's it, how do you live life when the normal is abject poverty, when it's chronic stress, when it's trauma being re-traumatized over and over again? And that's what it's like for me living in my part of Oakland, where you see regular violence, where you see regular, um, actually growing inequality, right? And <clears throat> So how do you deal with life when it doesn't seem secure, doesn't seem to change, and doesn't seem to um, have any hope? It is a really dark place where I live. Um, and so um, for me, you know, finding sources of strength and grace and hope on a day-to-day -day basis means both um, personal disciplines of prayer and scripture, um, corporate disciplines of um, small groups and church worship, I think, has, I found was always really important. Um, I run a lot. So I got, like, during the pandemic, I've run every day because um, I don't have to commute anymore. And so that's been a real help. I think during the pandemic, we, our church created more prayer times. And I think it's, you know, you know, the more stressed you are, the more you should pray. Um, and so I think those are these lifelong patterns that I've developed, um, both social and individual, that I think have really helped me. I, th I think I've gained a lot of perspectives from formerly incarcerated persons in our church. Because they, 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 they thought about the quarantine and the lockdown. And they go, this isn't anything new, you know. And I asked mm. them, how do you deal with it when nothing seems to change and you have the same thing day to day? And, and my, our formerly incarcerated people in our church were lifers. They were in lifetime prison. So they don't really have any prospect for change. I asked them, well, how did you deal with a lifetime of not really 
expecting your circumstances to change that much. Right. How do you deal with that? Yeah. And again, they, they said sort of the same things that they had to find. You know, it's a classic cliche, like, my body may be in prison, but my mind is free, you know? And yeah. it's true. Right. you got to liberate your mind and think, I'm not going to be bound by my circumstances, but I'm going to look at the world in a different way. I'm going to find both hope that things will get better because Jesus is coming back in the big picture. And I'm going to find hope in the little things each day. Like maybe I could share um, canteen with my fellow prisoners or maybe I'll get a letter. And so they found, they, they took little hopes. So me as a middle-class person, I go, oh yeah, eating ramen, I could do that anytime. I grab ramen anytime when I want to have a snack. But for them, you know, they really savor that time when they can mm -hmm. actually have a ramen party with their friends. And so learning to really be appreciative and mindful of the moment while also having a big picture, God's in control, God's loving and good, and we could rest on that. I think that's how I approach it. Um, having learned from my neighbors who are poor, having learned from my friends who are formerly incarcerated. Yeah, you know, <laughs> that's the thing is, the people around me have so much more faith than I do. And so, mm. you know, they, they're going through so much more struggle. And I just learned from their their resilience and their uh, how they hope. That's powerful. As you've been working on this huge project to document the anti-Asian racism happening right now, especially since the, the start of the pandemic, are you noticing less racism now? Has it gotten worse? Is like I'm just wondering the, the, the frequency of these um, tragic stories being submitted. Yeah, you know, I think it really peaked um, in March when Trump began to use the term Chinese virus. Um, it was a combination of everything. People were afraid of the pandemic and they didn't know how it was spread early on. They didn't know where it came from early on. And so when they saw Asians, they were more fearful and then they reacted a lot more out of that fear. At the same time, when the term Chinese virus began to circulate so much, um, that term um, racializes a virus so that you think of the virus as being Chinese and instead of just a, like a biological virus. And then Chinese people got signified, right? The vir Chinese people have the virus. So that, you, that the use of the term just incited racism right, right. and gave people license to hate. And so we saw a big spike then. Um, it was the confluence of the timing, people are unaware. Asians were wearing masks early on. People weren't, other Americans weren't used to seeing people on masks. So if an Asian wore a mask and you think, oh, they're infected. And right. so you're more likely to be attacked than others. And uh, it's dropped off since then. But the underlying roots, right? The xenophobia against China as a foreign threat, the yellow peril stereotype that Asians are just dirty and unclean. Um, the Christian nationalism that America should be white, all those things are still present and under new conditions, they could spark up again. So that's why we say Asian American status is really conditional. That when you're, we could be in favor, right? We could be the model minority, crazy rich Asians, people sort of like us. And then the next year quickly, we're crazy infected Asians and we're like, Policies are actually enacted to exclude us, to keep us out, right? We were actually half the Asians in America have been discriminated against, right? That's a huge number. And so you could see in conditions of epidemic, conditions of war, and conditions of economic downturn, um, racism against Asian Americans could really spike. And that's what we had this year, the condition of pandemic, the condition of um the worst recession since the Great Depression, and we had a Cold War against China. So we had the three racial racism conditions happen last year. And it's like you were saying, it is global. I mean, even the World Health Organization came out with documentation talking about the stigma, showing the research of the rise of xenophobia, anti-Asian racism behavior happening all over. Have you found the church, and I'm speaking specifically about the white evangelical church, um, have they been helpful in talking about this issue? I think some segments are. Um, so what happened is I've been actually, while I've been really discouraged by the, and actually traumatized by reading. So we have thousands of incidents of anti-Asian hate. 
And I see what people yell at us. I see how they throw rocks and bottles at us. I see how they attack our elderly and babies. People really attack vulnerable, bullies attack vulnerable people. So I see that. And I see the policies that are enacted against us, immigration bans, cuts to refugee, cuts to our forms of communication like WeChat, cuts to racial sensitivity trainings. I actually was banned from my talks because I talk about this, right? Really? So I, had, I had a contract cut. A, a, a speech I was going to give was actually um, canceled. So all these policies um, come along with the racist interpersonal attacks. That's been our history in Asian America. but. The, but whenever, so history is repeating itself, right? The epidemic comes, we we're met with interpersonal violence and racist policies. But history repeats itself in that every time Asian Americans were met with racism, they fought against it. And that's been repeated this time too. I've really seen the Asian American community stand up against the racism we're experiencing. And one place that I saw Asian Americans stand up was through the church. So there's a group called the Asian American Christian Collaborative. I helped to draft some of the opening statements. For me, it's the broadest ecumenical movement of Asian Americans that oh. I've seen in my lifetime. So they got over, I don't know, 12,000 signatures from both mainline, Catholic, evangelicals. And um, I was really stunned at the support of this group that primarily came about to fight racism against Asians during COVID-19. They got a lot of support from the Asian American community, and then they got a lot of support from other communities of color, and then they got a lot of support from white churches. And so I think that's one really good um, model and example of the church really rallying together to fight racism. And then in turn, we we launched that March, April, and then George Floyd killings came, right? And so that group really pivoted and said, well, that's wrong. That's not God's will or plan. And so there were a lot of Asian Christians for Black Lives Matter um, parades and rallies and prayer times. And I think, um, so I've seen a lot of solidarity during COVID and um, this summer of racial unrest. And I've seen a lot of uh, support from other people. Yeah, I think what's been, even though there's been a lot of, obviously, hate and incitement towards violence on social media channels, what has been nice is some of these campaigns, I think of like Stop the Hate, and how people of color are coming together to address social inequities, this violence, and these campaigns, like like you just mentioned, you're just bringing more attention to it, making sure that churches know about it, how to deal with it. Um, so I'm really glad to hear about some of the partnerships with with churches that are signing on to this document to address it. Have you found, um, for white evangelicals who maybe are not quite aware of how anti-Asian racism is impacting Asian Americans and Asian American churches. What would, what would be some things you would say to them to help them in their process that aren't getting educated and why it matters? So Asian Americans now um, are have the worst mental health during COVID-19 of any racial group in America. And that's because we have four stressors that maybe other groups may not necessarily be facing. First of all, we're fearful of COVID-19. We know, because we're more connected to Asia, how dangerous um, it is. Then, because we are more likely to live in multi-generational households, I know my students who are an Asian American, um, they were really concerned about not being spreaders, right? They don't want to get their grandparents sick. And so they're really stressed out about, like, I don't want to go out because I don't want to catch it and make my grandmother die. Um, Thirdly, because of the racism, people were avoiding Asian businesses early on, and that led to early business closures, and a lot of people in the service sector and in the restaurant industry, they all lost their jobs. So Asian Americans have the highest rate of unemployment after African Americans now because of COVID-19. So we're stressed because we're, we, we're worried about our health, our family's health, and then our economic livelihood. And then we're getting, if we do go out, we are getting attacked, right? You have to decide, mm. should I wear a mask or not? Either way, I, I could catch a disease or I could get attacked. 90% um, of Asian Americans say they're anxious or fearful about the racism they'll experience going out. So um, white evangelicals just can look at their Christian brothers and sisters and say, well, this is a group 
that um, has been even more impacted during the pandemic um, are having a difficult time and um, we should really support our brothers and sisters um, when they're facing so much racism and hostility. We should help people when people are being yelled at or shunned. We should uh, denounce racist rhetoric when we hear it. Yeah, you just brought up like four key things that every Christian needs to hear um, to know how they can better support our Asian American and also Asian friends at church. Um, Cause that is, that aware, just being aware of what you just said is super important. Um, so thank you so much for, for sharing that. And also Dr. Jung, thank you so much for the work you have been doing um, to help fight this racism towards Asian Americans during this time. And because all the, th all the stuff you're documenting, all those stories um, is super important to just show um, how how this pandemic is impacting our country. And also just like the underlying, like you're saying, like at the baseline, this stuff is happening. It exists. The racism is there. And sometimes people don't pay attention to it. And you're just like documenting, just showing it is there. This is the baseline. Like sometimes it's more visible than others. But yeah. this is just like, it's like a, it just kind of shows like, and these are just some of the stories for people that feel comfortable enough to share it. There's a lot of other stories that are not being told. Yeah, it's, we're, we always say it's just the tip of the iceberg, and um, and the you know America is founded on racism, right? And so we have structural roots in the stealing of indigenous land and African American labor and Asian labor, right? So um, it's hard to extricate ourselves from the roots of American colonialism and racism. Dr. Young, for those that I want to reach out to learn more about your books, your lectures, and um, other resources. What's the best way for them to do that? Check out stopaapihate.org about the racism and for my writings and stuff. Um, I wrote this book called At Home in Exile, and you just could look at athomeinexile.com. And it has some of my writings and um, stories about my book. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being on the podcast, Dr. Jung. Okay, thanks, Mike. Hey, thank you so much for checking out this video clip from the Dogato Podcast. To get more videos like this, simply subscribe here on YouTube. You can also download the full episode of each show on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, or your favorite podcast player. Take care.